it's time to begin the last panel of the day. The last, but not the least. So it's called state power and military forces, uh, a complex and changing relationship. And our first panelist um, will be virtual. Uh, Arthur, are you here? Yes. Thank you. So we will begin now. I'll share my screen. I'm having the same issue as yesterday. Alors, euh, donc, euh, mon intervention sera sur la neutralité. Today, I will be speaking about neutrality or the fantasy of inactivity for renewal of research on neutral states. To show this, here is a cartoon done by Chapat, a Swiss cartoonist in 1999 and it shows neutrality that is the one who is inactive is outside of the action outside of the conflict so i'll begin with this concept by klaus Esser. and in 2014 in the introduction to issue 159 of the journal relation internationale that contrary to what the term itself might suggest neutrals are not excluded from war they are actors in it Thus, if military history is above all centered on conflicts and the states taking part in these, it is not limited to belligerence. Although neutrality has often been studied from a legal or economic point of view, it is nevertheless treated in a laconic way in military history, even almost absent in educational and memorial discourse. This lack of interest illustrates a biased image limiting to symbolic role states that are nevertheless strategic in several conflicts and very present in certain areas. This paper will therefore try to introduce a reflection on neutrality in military history. To do so, we will start with a quick reminder of the nature of neutrality and its status in law. We will then go on to explain the gaps in research on this topic using the example of Swiss neutrality, and we will ask ourselves about the future and the possibilities of developing this approach. For this work, I would like to emphasize that I have mainly used secondary sources from French historiography or that are available in French. It is therefore possible that elements uh, from Anglo-Saxon currents are missing, and I would like to apologize vis-a-vis -vis our participants. First of all, as I said, we will speak to the notion of neutrality. And uh, I refer here to neutrality historical introduction in the context of the 1914 conference neutrality, neutralism in question. There, Henri Lego Harrell recalled that neutrality has been known in an abstract way since antiquity, where it takes the form of refusal to take sides in certain conflicts as described in Roman historiography. He established that, for example, the in France, it was also Caesar's civil war, where Caesar refused to fight. Uh, he says that this notion was also theorized and that as of the 16th century was put in place specifically by Albericus Gentile, an Italian jurist and professor at Oxford at the time. The notion then mainly concerned territorial sovereignty of neutrals, notably the prohibition of the passage of troops and equipment of fighting nations. The contemporary era brings the establishment of a form of legal neutrality that Henri Ligo Herrell places in the examples of the Treaty of Paris of 1856, the Anglo-American Treaty of 1871, and the Hague Conventions of 1907. I should also add to this lineage that the recognition of perpetual neutrality of Switzerland by the signatories of the Treaty of Paris in parallel to the Congress of Vienna of November 20, 1815. The central element in the law of war among neutral parties, uh, the Hague Conventions, represents the last major element. Again, that is part of the issue. If neutrality 
is finally defined legally and endowed with rights and duties. It does not obtain an update of its status despite a very clear evolution of the art of war since its signature. The We've seen the appearance of total war and aviation today, cyber wars in brief since 1907. We continue to see this and we wonder about how to define neutrality today since we have the notion of non-belligerence. As I said, it's a notion that's being called into question and which remains vague. Um, in 1987, we saw Natalie Bonuel uh, with the policy of Swedish neutral active neutrality it reminds us that since the First World War, the rules of the Hague Conventions have been rendered obsolete by the appearance of total war, which involves all sectors of society, including the economy. And we've seen that with the attacks of U-boats uh, uh, against the American Marine during the First World War and at the beginning of the Second World War. And to this criticism, and I've come a bit lost, uh, so Antigua also agrees with this idea in a speech already cited, and since 1907 has cited the law of neutrality and says that it has involved considerably on the one hand because of the total character of modern wars that is knit to a nibbling if you like of the rights of neutrals and on a military level the progress of arms technology especially in the air is such that neutral states are less and less able to escape armed operations again i come back to switzerland during world war ii there were uh, confrontations between the swiss and german air forces we also had the americans and the british in northern italy and they were more and more visible and they has led to these led to confrontations between the parties as i said there is more and more question as to cyber weapons being used in recent years such as the digital warfare being waged by russia against western interests So the issues of dealing with the history and form neutrality are perhaps best illustrated by the case of Switzerland during World War II. Switzerland is a strong symbol of neutrality. It is a small Alpine state, and it's been the subject of true questioning about its activities with Nazi Germany from the end of the conflict. This questioning reached its peak in the 1980s and 1990s, with the publication in 1983 of Nouvelle Histoire de la Suisse et des Suisses, New History of Switzerland and the Swiss, in which Hans Ulrich Jost attacks the image of Swiss neutrality in the 20th century. And then at the end of the 1990s, with the work of the Bergier Commission, which highlights the links between Swiss banks and the Nazi banking system. This trend was itself challenged by other authors, including the former president of the Confederation and historian Georges Andre Chevalas the Swiss historian Jean-Jacques Langendorf, and several American authors who emphasized the Swiss spirit of resistance. In this debate, several elements should be noted. First of all, as Nathalie Blanoa notes in the case of Swedish neutrality, the effects and external interest of neutrality are taboo elements in the discourse of neutral states because they call into question the independence of the concept. However, as Samuel Kruziga points out in his contribution to neutrality in the Cambridge history of the First World War, which was quoted by Alain Clavier and Claude Hauser in an article already cited, neutrality, and I quote, neutrality during the First World War has been the subject of numerous national studies, most of which were written in the language of the country concerned. This is the main reason why we find few general analyses, even comparative studies on the subject. Thus, the subject remains above all the prerogative of a national academic environment impacted by the taboo. The demonstration of this is illustrated here by the reactions to Jost's criticism. Similarly, certain American authors dealing with the question use it in perspective defense of individual liberties, notably in the context of questioning the Second Amendment. For example, this is the case of a number of works written by Stephen Holbrook on the NRA as to Swiss resistance. As for the critical camp of neutrality, it's important to note the context of American pressure in the 1990s, the case of the unclaimed accounts. The shortcomings of the work on Swiss neutrality can be found in another area, that of the lines of work. Thus, 
If just defends any desire for politicized discourse, it should nevertheless be noted that his vision of neutrality suffers from a bias towards the political and economic aspects of the conflict. Therefore, his work on new history of Switzerland and the Swiss leaves little room for questions such as the quality of the Swiss army, its evolution, or its actions during the two world conflicts. For example, we're no longer dealing with economic and political issues. For example, we have the role of Swiss industry vis-a-vis -vis Germany, the political actions undertaken by the government. For example, we have the example of the internment, something we've been dealing with. So the internment of foreign troops in 1939 to 1945 is only vaguely mentioned during in this work, despite the 110 thousand personnel represents out of a population estimated at four million at the time so that's a very large uh, population which had an impact uh, on mobilization of troops used by switzerland but we should note that hans ulrich jost himself acknowledges that the legal time limits for consulting the swiss federal archives prevented him from providing a satisfactory overview of the sources. So it is possible that he would have put forth another solution. This bias illustrates an imaginary and a vision of things often anchored outside the military demands by its absence of open action. Joe summarizes the questions of mobilizations and clashes on a few pages out of a hundred, but also by the secret character of several types of actions in neutral countries, such as negotiation, spying, smuggling, the military treatment of this question, although it is very much linked to the world of conflicts, is therefore placed in a se second place, put in second place and forgotten. So if the state of research on the question is, as we've seen, limited by the fog surrounding the notion, the problems of bias and taboo, it should also be noted that interest in it remains and has been subject to, to a certain of a certain revival in the 2010s. Thus, as part of the commemorations, a connection with the centenary of the First World War, two conferences were organized in the issue of neutrality in the Great War, in the Francophone milieu. The first at the University of Freiburg on May 23rd and 24, 2014, which dealt largely with issues of international relations, but also with questions deeply linked to military history, as in Hazuki Tati's interventions on prisoners of war and Switzerland. As well, the second conference, 1940 Neutralities, Neutralisms in Question, which was held at the Cervantes Institute of Paris, offered a broad panel offering a place to important elements for the historical military treatments of the field, such as the definition of the notion of neutrality and its issues. There is much to be done to develop the question of the military history of neutrality beyond the commemorations of the Great War. Few work in French, few works in French deal with the issue and its history outside of law. As well, many aspects remain little known. Treated in the image of the internment of sick or wounded prisoners during the First World War, despite an article published by Marianne Valle on the subject of the journal Guerre Mondiale et Conflits Contemporains in 2014. There's also an absence of monographs in French on the evolution of Swiss armies, although Pierre Streit and Jean-Jacques Langendorf provided a book on the Swiss army and people between 1940 and 1945, and this was published in 2007, or contemporary Swedish armies, a subject that is nonetheless useful for understanding the evolution of armies with no recent combat experience, particularly in the context of a return to high intensity. Although Western countries might have been facing these kinds of conflicts for decades now. As well, the subject should all, however, be of interest in questioning the face of current events where the notion of neutrality and non-belligerence reappears. The conflict in two recent conflict have shown the importance of non-belligerence in the Upper Karabakh with Turkey's presence to deliver information, uh, intelligence, and and especially the conflict in Ukraine shows the central place of non-belligerence in current conflicts that we've seen different interventions. We've seen uh, NATO's interventions as well, and a number of other countries of the bloc, the Western bloc, to support Ukraine. Material has been sent. Therefore, I think that we need to re-examine the issue. These conflicts also bring back the issue of morality. For example, 
the morality of Swiss neutrality after the Swiss refusal to authorize the shipment of to Ukraine of munitions sold by Swiss companies to Germany. So the role of neutrality in the 21st century, its moral aspects. For example, the uh, Stock International Peace Research Institute noted that in 2001, Sweden was the third most important importer of weapons, but it remained uh, neutral and uh, Austria was also there. So these are issues that we have to ask for the 21st century if we want to revisit neutrality. So what can we retain as a conclusion to this intervention? We've seen that although work exists on neutrality, this work is often the product of national works or dealing with non-military issues. As well, we've seen that the history and definition of the concept of neutrality by their complexity hinder the creation of a real current of neutral studies. This lack of debate or current of thought was already put forward by Samuel Kruzinga in his work. Therefore, for the future of research in this field, is key to allow the establishment of a transnational research on a military history of neutrality, thus offering a free vision of natural prejudices and taboos by building on the momentum generated by the center of great war. The birth of such a current would thus be beneficial for research at a time when the law of war could be reformed and when a new reflection must be born on the conduct of war and neutrality. Thank you very much. And thank you as well to the interpreters. Merci, Arthur. Manu? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to CIDP for selecting my abstract for the conference. Uh, my name is Manaswani Ramkumar, and I'm a PhD candidate at the School of International Service at American University in Washington, DC. Uh, as I'm in the last panel, I will try to make this interesting and worthwhile. So thank you for bearing with me. Uh, this is the structure of my presentation today. Uh, I will briefly touch upon my doctoral research because the paper that I'm presenting today is an outgrowth from my fieldwork. Then I'll introduce the topic, so define nationalism, explain its typology in relation to the argument of my paper, explain the relationship between nationalism and the military, what are the effects of nationalism on diverse militaries, and present India as a case study to empirically understand the consequences of nationalism on the military institution. My PhD research concerns civil military relations in the context of democratic erosion. And by erosion, I mean a deliberate attempt to remove or dilute democratic institutions and norms by leaders who have been elected to power in a democratic manner. So I try to understand the interaction between an undemocratic leader and a democratic military. And what do I mean by a democratic military? It's a military that has never overthrown civilian leadership or behaved in an insubordinate manner that threatens the country's democratic stability. So I try to study how a democratic military responds to demands made by an undemocratic leader. I conducted field work in India between October 2021 to January 2022, and because of Omicron, I had to pause my research, come back to Canada, and then fly back again in April uh, and stay until July of 2022. My field work consisted of archival research at state archives and military think tanks, elite interviews with academics who study Indian military and Indian security and civil military relations, retired and active duty officers, retired civil servants who worked in the Ministry of Defense, and faculty at professional military education institutions. And today's presentation is an exploratory paper that came out of the insights from my interviewees. So briefly, I'd like to begin with a definition of nationalism from one of the foundational scholars of nationalism in comparative politics, Ernest Gellner. According to Gellner, nationalism, a celebration of the nation, involves a desire for political sovereignty exercised by a nation over a given territory, and is thus the political principle which holds that the political and the national unit should be congruent. Please pay attention to the last part. I think I actually bolded it. Is this the latest version of the presentation? Oh, okay, that's okay, thank you. 
Okay, uh, so I'd like to focus our attention on this on this last part. Those people who make up a nation are physically, emotionally, financially, socially, and politically invested in the effort to make the political unit or the state congruent with who they are. So congruent with the nation. So they'll vie for power, they'll contest in elections, they'll try to get political power and recognition that helps make this desired congruency a reality so that the state becomes synonymous with the nation and the nation becomes synonymous with the state. And they'll try to obstruct, thwart, or destroy any attempts that are made to dilute their goal, modify their goal, or obstruct their goal. So nationalists are very keen on achieving political power so that their nation becomes the state. My research tries to supplement the existing distinction between civic and ethnic nationalism that already exists in the field. So what we understand as civic nationalism is what was characteristic of the self-determination and freedom movements in the 20th century, where colonized nationalistic leaders like Nelson Mandela, like Mahatma Gandhi, used the language of national identity, which was separate and apart from how the colonizers defined them, to overthrow exploitative colonial regimes. But this form of national identity is not just a relic of the past. It continues to exist and be invoked in public speeches even now. Like when the Indonesian president, uh, Jokowi, in 2021, evoked the official foundational philosophy of Indonesia, the Panchashila, that talks about unity, social justice for all of the people of Indonesia, and mutual cooperation as values that have helped and will continue to help Indonesia overcome the hardships of the pandemic. Another example is the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's 2017 speech on Canadian Multiculturalism Day, when he explained that Canada's national identity is based on shared values rather than on ethnic, religious, historical, or geographic grounds. Now contrast this kind of inclusive nationalism, this umbrella nationalism, with the kind that is worryingly trending in the last decade or so. Right? So as opposed to self-determination movements of the 20th century, the nationalism that's predominant right now is what I call the great determination movements, where there's a mythical golden age from the past, and that's foisted onto a narrative of weakness and degeneration that apparently leaders believe are affecting their states right now. The most famous examples of this are Trump's Make America Great Again, Jair Bolsonaro's Make Brazil Great Again, and Viktor Orban's Make Hungary Great Again movements. Rather than a values-based national identity, which was the civic nationalism, ethnic nationalism prioritizes a scriptive identity-based national identity. So it is an exclusionary, dividing kind of identity that helps legitimate a society's pre-existing social cleavages or ethnic or racial or religious hierarchies. So like white nationalism in the US or Hindu nationalism in India or Han nationalism in China, Buddhist nationalism in Myanmar or Sri Lanka and Christian nationalism in most of Europe. What is the relationship between nationalism and the military? This relationship has been explored so far primarily in terms of how nationalism actually affects the military's ability to perform its primary role of war fighting. So how nationalism affects the military to function. To that end, uh, we can think of nationalism as an effective source of military power, right? Apart from technology, so good military fighting equipment and good training, feelings of national identity and one's pride with the nation make up the resolve or will of the fighting force, right? And it was this resolve that was frequently alluded to in the early weeks of Ukraine's response to Russian aggression before Ukraine started getting strengthened by material capabilities through foreign military support, right? So it's the Ukrainian people's will and resolve to fight for their homeland that helped slow Russian aggression in the initial weeks of the war. Nationalism can also act as a recruitment tool for the military. And indeed, this was the first basis for, say, Napoleon's massively large armies through the Levée en masse. Many countries continue to still use nationalistic language as a basis for their national conscription policies, right? So it continues to exist as a recruitment tool for the military. Thirdly, nationalism has been linked to higher propensity of conflict, 
both interstate conflicts, so where states fight other states, and intrastate conflicts, so a conflict within a state. Um, of the first kind, nationalism permits or compels leaders to pursue reckless foreign policies that can increase the likelihood of war. So for example, uh, anytime there's an issue between India and Pakistan, uh, citizens of both India and Pakistan will goad their leaders to do um, an offensive military strike. So there'll be jingoistic calls for doing a cross-border strike just to allay any perceived fears that the citizens might have, or just to show their strength, you know, saying, oh, India can, you know, sort of take out these terrorist camps. Uh, and this shows India's strength versus Pakistan's weakness. Uh, or this is also an example of uh, in 1982, when Argentina used a diversionary invasion of the Malvinas Falklands Islands, when General Galtieri was keen on distracting Argentine citizens from widespread economic poverty and unemployment and inflation issues. So uh, nationalism can be used as a diversionary tactic to unnecessarily increase the likelihood of conflict happening. Lastly, because of the nature of nationalist movements themselves, Remember from my definition about the congruency between the national unit and the political unit, right? Nationalism increases the likelihood of violent intrastate conflict. Uh, you can have secessionist movements like the Kurdish Workers' Party, right? PKK fighting against Turkey, or the LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, a Tamil nationalist group fighting against the Sri Lankan government for political autonomy and recognition. So nationalist sentiments that exist in these situations could be the situation where a government has to fight a portion of their own citizens, so an interstate conflict, or it need not always presuppose a minority group's grievance against a majority. Yeah? So nationalist grievances can also be fabricated. They can be engineered or manufactured by political elites for political survival and power. This was the case of Serbian leaders fomenting Serbian nationalism to make up a greater Serbia from parts of Croatia and Bosnia during the Ukrainian war. My research attempts to fill a gap in the study of nationalism and military by focusing on the effects of nationalism to the military institution itself rather than on its functional performance. The principal dilemma of civil military relations deals with having a military that is strong enough to defend the state, but subordinate enough only to use its strength when it's asked by civilian leaders, right? So for this to happen, the state must always be above the military in the decision-making hierarchy. Democracies among all of the states have tried to resolve this dilemma by trying to implement measures for civilian oversight on a military that is deliberately kept at an arm's length from politics, right? So you don't want military to interfere in politics. So civilian leaders will oversee defense budgets, they'll oversee acquisition decisions, they have regular hearings on military deployment, they hold the military accountable for their performance, and in return for the military being subordinate, the military is promised some level of autonomy with low levels of political interference in internal affairs, like how they recruit soldiers or how they promote senior officers. But this bargain gets appended, so it gets destroyed when politics becomes more nationalistic because nationalist leaders use the military to bolster their own legitimacy, to gain popular support and enhance their own power. And in so doing, they increasingly draw the military into politics and help transform an apolitical professional organization into a partisan arm of the ruling party. Uh, some of the examples that we have of this would be in June 2020, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protest movement across cities in the US. Uh, DC was also in the throes of uh, protest against police brutality. President Trump wanted to use the military and the National Guard units to intervene and fire at protesters. And senior retired officers condemned Trump's response, saying that it's not the military's job to fire at protesters. This is not what we're trained to do. This is not what we're supposed to do. Uh, for example, in Hungary, to stop migrants from crossing the Mediterranean and entering Europe, Orban advocated for the use of the military to defend Hungary's borders to stop immigration, creating a dangerous comparison between migrants who were fleeing war and economic devastation to them being like a foreign invading army. Brazil's president, who came to power, having praised Brazil's two-decade-long brutal military dictatorship, claimed that the military will do whatever he wants even if it meant them being used to stop protesters against Brazil's disastrous COVID response. And apparently also in 2021, he put his former chief of staff in charge of the defense, in charge of the defense ministry and swapped all three commanders of the armed forces suddenly 
for a cabinet reshuffle. So he just uh, kicked them out of their uh, power. And lastly, in 2019 in India, when the government came out with a constitutional amendment to decide on a religious basis for Indian citizenship, there were widespread protests requiring the deployment of the army, converting some cities to look like a war zone. So what are the consequences of becoming a, a partisan military? So how does nationalism actually affect the military? Firstly, we will see the national military of a state slowly transform into a politicized shell of its former self by becoming a force responsive, not to citizens of a state, but to a group of people who are identified with the nation. So this is not a military for everyone. This is a military for a certain group of people who make up the nation. Secondly, we're likely to witness an erosion of meritocratic promotions to the officer corps, right? So instead, what the nationalist leader will do is promote, intervene in promotion decisions and promote officers based on loyalty, either to the leader or to the ruling ideology. So it's not meritocratic advancement anymore. Uh, thirdly, if loyalty does become the basis for senior promotions, then we're more likely to see a military that has reduced operational effectiveness because skilled commanders now have been replaced by loyalist commanders. And these need not be the most operationally experienced or skilled people. Finally, one of the most disastrous consequences of a professional military becoming a partisan one has to do with disruptions to the military's internal cohesion. So militaries are effective institutions owing to high levels of internal cohesion, right? And they form this internal cohesion through years of rigorous training, exercises, uh, education, bonding during deployments, right? So they become a cohesive, skilled fighting force. Nationalist leaders would create tensions within the military, causing the military to internally fracture and split into camps between those who support the leader so those who embrace the change and those who like the leader and those who want to maintain the status quo. So it could become an internally incohesive institution, which threatens the military's ability to fight as an operationally effective force. Um, last two slides. So on my case study on India, uh, so this is the last part of the presentation uh, where I empirically demonstrate what I've explained to you in theory. So the Indian military at the time of India's independence was this large, well-experienced, colonially very well-deployed force. And they were now struggling to become from a colonial army to a post-colonial armed force, right? So at that point, India's leaders were worried that you know this could be a military that's so big, that's so organizationally capable, they could overthrow the civilian government. They could do a coup. So instead, what they did was try to make these coup-proofing policies and measures, you know, to make sure that the military does not overthrow them. And these are some of the examples of what they did. You know, they reduced the importance of the commander-in-chief position. They tried to convert a British ethnic recruitment policy to a regional and religiously representative national representative army policy. And they tried to emphasize meritocratic advancement uh, because they didn't want to become like the Pakistani military that got mired in internal politics. And so the, for the Indian military, becoming like the Pakistani military is the worst thing in the world because they keep fighting them and defeating them in wars. So they definitely don't want to become like the Pakistani military. Um, okay, so this is the last slide. <laughs> so, um, so in terms of examples, uh, based on the four things that I told you earlier about loyalist promotions, the military becoming from a national army to a politicized army, these are examples of what's happening in India right now. A routine religious celebration from, for an Islamic function that was tweeted by the Ministry of Defense it had to be removed because of trolls from the Hindu majority party criticizing the military for celebrating a Muslim function. Uh, the second headline is about a change in how senior promotions are going to happen within the Indian military. Before it was based on seniority, now the government has come up with a meritocratic system, uh, which is whoever the government defines as meritorious is the one who's going to be promoted. So you can imagine, how the government is going to define what constitutes merit, right? So there's pushback by retired military officers. Uh, the Indian military is coming out with a new recruitment system this year for recruiting 18 to 29 year olds only for a four year term. So they're basically coming as interns. And at the end of four years, only 25% of those people are going to be retained for future military service. The rest are going to be disbanded. So essentially, Every four years, we could see military weapons trained young people 
be released into society with no chance of uh, getting a job or you know working. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Right. Uh, that's the end. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you very much for CIDP for supporting me. I'll be delivering my presentation in French. Thank you very much to our interpreters for their work. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. I think it's extremely interesting for several researchers to share their perspective and their reading on this topic. So I'm very honored to be here. So thank you very much. My name is Benjamin Tubal. I'm a PhD, PhD student at the Department of Political Science at Laval University. And I have a background in geopolitics of uh, the French Geopolitical Institute in Paris. So with this very impressive or not title, actually what we see here is a story. The first research I conducted was in 2017 in the capital of the Kurdistan, Iraq, independent province. And I was having a coffee. At a certain point, I wanted to eat the biryani biryani, which is a national dish. There are different types, and I've heard about it a great deal, but apparently it's one of the national special dishes. It's, it's the Kurdish biryani, except what I did not know is that I was looking to eat a local biryani, and the restaurant owner was a Syrian Kurd. His origin was very different from Iranian, Iraqian Kurds, when I asked for the dish, he looked at me with big eyes and he says, no, 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 no. Here we serve Syrian biryanis. And I knew nothing about the situation. I said something stupid. I said, I'd like a Syrian biryani, but behind me was a veteran of the Kurdish forces, as I learned later, but an Iraqi Kurdian who started to have a fight with this gentleman. He said, no, this is an Iraqi dish. It's not Syrian. On top of that, we had a uniformed soldier who came in. He was Christian. He came in with a hatch from the Christian Kurdish groups. And he said, no, 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 biryani is the national dish. That is Christian, Syrian, Christian, Kurdish. So then I ended up with three persons uh, fighting about where this national Kurdish dish come in. I still had not received my biryana, but all of this to say that everything did turn out well, and it allowed me to have some very interesting context. But it really made me want to write a thesis as to how, again, uh, food can be very interesting. So today, I'd like to present my current research work which is a critical approach to the state violence model, and I'll read it. So this a critical approach to the state violence model brings, this is from the margins outside the boats, state power and military force a complex and changing relationship here. But we have a number, I have a number of research objectives that have brought me to this research. The first, is to update a concept. What I found of interest here, and what is so interesting in this conference is to look at different of perspectives of change in the military sphere. We've spoken a lot about the Canadian military milieu, which I find fascinating. Again, I'd like to present a uh, case study from the field to see how military institutions are seen elsewhere, and more specifically in Iraq, and how the balance of power is seen, whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous in Kurdistan, Iraq. So what I'm interested in is to 
update the concept of monopoly of power, that is, who are the main actors that use force, whether it be in management or coercion on the, in the, on the field, that is, who holds the power to restrict or manage training of troops and units, and who then has the power to especially punish, whether this be locally with the police or with the army in Kashmir. Who actually holds that power? So I'll speak to this in a moment. Again, this calls into question this ownership, this centralization of legitimate force. And what's interest is this first concept that I wanted to develop here. So the second objective is to renew this paradigm or to look at a number of paradigms. And that is the state periphery. It's in Iraq. We're in the northern part of Iraq. There are many ethnic groups and peoples. So beyond the geopolitical situation, we need to consider that this is not a homogeneous state with a homogeneous army in this region. We have uh, a state actor represented by the capital, Erbid, and on the outlying areas, you have villages that first are going to uh, claim their territorial origins before they attach themselves to nationally. First of all, they consider themselves as uh, Shiit, Sunni, uh, Kurds, before that they identify as being Iraqi. The second concept is, is to say that with a military heterogeneous institution, there is a dynamic that's outside of the state. So we call into question one's origins, but you also call into question the whole concept of a state with uh, the ability to use force and with an identity that is defined here. And the third purpose is a multi-layer approach. And this is my uh, overlaying of power, which is included in this regionalism, whether this be a centralized practice in the capital's institutions, or this could also be overlaid of regional and territorial institutions of representatives in the territories or around them. So we have this case study, and that is Kurdistan, Iraq. And why this case? Because this province has seen many ups and downs, that's the least we could say, since World War II. And that's very generalized. But even if you go back to the Geneva Agreements from 1920, which uh, uh, proposed to the Kurds to have their own state. And finally, the British and the French agreed to promise this national project to the Kurds, which they had never had, and which in fact led to uh, an increase of fragmentation of these national claims. and then led to the Iraqi state as we know it today. As a result, uh, science has then looked at a certain monopoly of violence. And again, the issue of legitimate, a legitimate force monopoly, that's a new way to seeing state violence. So my thesis question is really about this paradigm. It's about quanta question this of this concept is so how do we see security through armed groups that are non-state groups as being kind of sidelines to security so how do you interpret outside operations of diplomatic actions and uh, how do you see these who are our interlocutors who are our partners to ensure regional stabilization, and in this particular case, who can we count on to assure regional security? 
the post-Islamic state. So my main thesis is in three parts, and let me read this, that the state, the construction of an Iraqi Kurdistan state is uh, the theater for uh, multiple use of legitimate force. And there are many groups uh, that lay claim to the territories. We have armed groups. There, we still have armed groups that are Kurdish and Iraqi. Uh, we have Christians. There are Shiites and Sunnit Kurdish Iraqis. The second point of my main thesis is this polycentricity that is this multi-layer dynamic strengthens the dynamic between the state and regional outlying regions in a proto-state context. What do I mean? That this are things that come out of a civil conflict and either to defend the country or that is in defense of national independence or to fight against it. And again, the decentralization of legitimacy actually strengthens the hybridization of uh, state security within various populations in the region. That is, we have uh, armed groups and there are also different ethnic groups that uh, bring the military institutions to see increased fragmentation. So the purpose of updating this concept is to update the, the Hiberian grid, that is how is violence monopolized, how is force monopolized, that is includes Western armies and what are their claims. So we're seeing centralization of military authority as a result throughout history. And of course, in the case of Europe, at the end of World War II, it has allowed for them to reappropriate the power and authority and to regroup that under a single uh, military institution and army. So this is a means of seeing this monopoly. Again, this is more regionalistic reading of force, which exists elsewhere than uh, Europe. And it's a hermeneutical and critical reading of the state of violence. So today, we find ourselves between regulation and monopoly. In the middle, it's an oligopoly. So we move from regulation of local violence. We're trying to find a balance between local violence and the legitimate use of national violence. So on one hand, armed groups, and on the other hand, we have official institutions, and we find something in between, which also delegates this armed force and monopolizes it. So this is what I posit as extra national and extra state players. Again, what does it mean to renew the paradigm? It means of regional institutions, and you also have the Valenstein's world system theory model, it means that you have one state, one army. Rather, we have a periphery which has as much power, which exists side by side with the state, and a state which also exists within this periphery, this outlying region. So what we're facing, that is the situation in Afghanistan, we're seeing a fragmentation of uh, the various axes of violence, and in Iraq, in this particular case, that is still the case. And because Turkestan and Iraq have military Kurdish and Iraqi institutions. They have attempted to take ownership of certain armed groups. And as well, we, we saw the Islamic State. So, and I have reproduced the Palestine's table to show that this semi-periphery actually uh, legitimizes this circle of violence between the inner area and the outer area. So. Here you have uh, the major Kurdish factions. You have all of the action actors. Everybody is trying to fragmentize a military institution to justify national movements that are different. And today, that's the case in Kurdistan. So why non-state? Because this is a fairly simplified Diagram. We have uh, armed non-state groups. They are self-defense, militia, 
private militia and paramilitary groups. These are armed groups that were hired by political parties, the main ones in Kurdistan. That's the Democratic Party, which recruited its own militia. So you have these non-state armed groups. Then they claim a national state, and especially they identify with a local ethnic identity. And so this brings us back to this multi-layer governance. It represents individuals in a village on a small territory. They represent their own perception of security, justice, administration, and social rules. So on the one hand, that is to the left of west of Kurdistan, Iraq, you have the uh, triangle with the former uh, self-defense groups, the groups there who all represent some quite some previous social rules. But all of this brings to national leaders a certain amount of legitimacy. In fact, they share this legitimacy, legitimacy with the national actors. When I speak nationally, that is Kurdistan on a larger scale. You also have the same thing exactly on the Iraq level. So they represent these communities. Uh, they take charge of these local communities, and they have their local leaders, both legal and national leaders, who then similarly claim legitimacy that is brought to them through the legitimacy of the political parties. So I have one minute left, so I'll speed up. In fact, I should have shown you this map at the very beginning. So. Kurdistan Iraqi is divided into three areas. First, you have the yellow zone of the Iraq government and the gray and red areas, although it's changed a bit since. Those are the area of confrontation between, all right, right, it's rather sort of gray, green, but the area of conflict between the Iraqi militias and Shahabi or the Iraqi army against the Kurdish forces, so it is a conflict zone. And in red, these are the lost zones, or the zones rather lost by the Kurdish army in Ipechnada, either for the Sumits and Iraq's army. So I talked about this oligopoly. See, we have a number of different actors different types of violence. And again, this represents the regional complexity. We have regional actors, where the Thespian Rojava, the Western Kurdistan area, or in Bakur, in Northern Kurdistan, in Turkish Kurdistan. So we have many, many actors here who all have their own legitimacy and social local rules. At the end of the day, these might or not be endowed with legitimacy by the central state. So how to further develop our knowledge is that we are, what I'm trying to develop is a reading that enables us to identify, to define uh, based on more local knowledge, uh, the various actors involved. There is some work underway, and in this particular case, uh, there is uh, the study underway to enable us to better understand the actors uh, in the field and to really call into question this binary diagram that is between the state and grouped arms. We're trying to find something that really is more fragmented. And thank you. I apologize for being late a little bit, but thank you very much for listening. Uh, bonjour. Je voudrais d'abord remercier le CIDP de l'opportunité qu'il m'offre. Thank you very much to the CIDP for giving me the opportunity to talk about the impact of uh, artificial intelligence on the military power of a state. My name is Mr. Gateau, and I am interested in uh, on I, which is IA artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence, AI, is a major technological innovation, and the link to the military power is still ambiguous. It's presented as the fourth revolution in military affairs, called RAM, 
and uh, it could modify power relations on the, the international scene and significantly transform military operations. For instance, Ping 2018 could say that IA could actually strengthen a number of things. IA is supposed to transform the configuration of the international situation by uh, by changing conflictuality. So for several people, IA, AI could be could, could be transforming a number of things in the next decade as part of a revolution that has already started. Considering the potential of AI um, in the military, we would like to know whether or not AI could potentially strengthen the military power of a state. AI is said to, to transform the uh, balance of power, but I'm going to show that it's not going to have the impact of a revolution because RAM actually implies strategic changes in the strength and deep social differences. I'm also going to show that even though technological uh, progress can actually change a number of things, it's not going to change the power of a state with three main arguments basing myself on the work of Orwitz in 2018, Jensen and Al in 2020. Number one, AI could have little strategic effect because it's not a military innovation in itself and doesn't actually change the uh, behavior of an army, which is absolutely crucial in order to determine the power of an army. Number two, technology is rarely the only factor to actually change the balance and the strength. Bureaucracy could also uh, reinforce the power of a state. And number three, cultural, financial, legal, human, etc. factors could need would need to actually be taken into account in order to determine how AI could actually be translated in military capacity. I will also show the risks in order to actually show that um, uh, AI could also be a major potential source of instability and strategic rivalry. There are three things that actually show the development of AI, the power of calculation of uh, IT. Uh, and there's no definition of AI. For instance, Cummings 2017 actually says that it's the capacity of computers to actually uh, do a number of things. It is programmed in order to work on cognition and action. There are two things. Number one, AI actually uh, defines behaviors, and number two, IT behaviors in order to recognize some things based on calculations. We're also talking about super intelligence AI with algorithms that are making it possible to do several complex things, but also to think about itself it, using solutions for very complex problems. Several applications are already being used. For instance, the autonomy of drones facilitating a number of things during simulation exercises and intelligence and recognition and uh, uh, technologies anti-missile defense systems, etc. Several projects also in the US, including the MAVEN project, in order to give better um, quality information to inform the decision-making process. Also in Israel, Raphael Avens' different system developed a weapon using AI for the automatic recognition of targets. In China, the Chinese army has been developing intelligent weapons with um, 
information gathering capacities. The main benefits of AI is that it actually gives a better understanding of the uh, combat zones, more anticipation, better surveillance and recognition cap capabilities, etc. So it is clear that for the main military powers, the applications of AI have a, are significant. But you still have to wonder whether or not this is a true revolution in military affairs. As you know, the uh, concept of military revolution brings you back to a brutal and, and quick change in, in the way you handle conflict, for instance, a series of quick changes in the techniques of war have completely transformed war. Portman in 2013 actually mentioned traditional example of war, including, for instance, the introduction of firearms on the battlefield, the transformation of transportation, blitz wars in 1939 and 40, and nuclear weapons. So a military revolution brings you back to qualitative changes in the structure of armies and in the way they, they, they handle the combat, which brings to political and social changes. For instance, I, I don't have the, the, the time to talk about all the details, but I could tell you that RAM revolution of military affairs means synergy of three elements, components, number one, a revolution at the technical level, an adaptation of the strategies, an adaptation of the military organizations. The question is whether or not the dissemination of AI could also lead to a major transformation at the military level, or if it's just a matter of evolution. According to several authors, even though the applications of AI are still limited, it could potentially develop itself quickly and lead to a revolution of military affairs. An author actually said that a that AI is going to lead to a new way of conducting war. Raska actually says that a new wave of rent based on AI has already emerged. As far as I'm concerned, I believe that the changes that AI could potentially lead to are not at the level of a RAM. It is only an evolution. And in order to confirm that, I would like to show you the three things that Foreman actually talked about in order to explain evolution. Number one, evolution is an internal process that is relatively long that requires patient work by the officers. Number two, innovation requires the intervention of political authority that is the only one that could actually impose changes to the military leadership. So it can only come from the outside. Number three, it comes from the competition between the various army corps that really want to change in a radical way, the way they handle things in order to maintain rare resources. Based on that, you can actually say that the competition between the military corps can actually lead them to develop AI applications to be more perform to have better performance, but that doesn't mean that they could actually lead to com a complete change. Number two, except for a few ch rare cases like China and US, the political legislators uh, to use AI is not sufficient. Fortman in 2013 actually showed that without political intervention, the army doesn't innovate. And so it's a good thing to actually show the difference between the various adaptation measures that uh, traditional organizations would need to use to get more modern and a true transformation of the army. Beyond all of this, new doctrines need to be need to emerge in order to strengthen a new army ram also has an impact on society and the political system not only the technologies of ai do not lead to this but they also do not strengthen the military capacity of a, of a, of a state and this is what i'm going to show now Indeed, it doesn't show an impact on the power of the army. 
even though the technology could actually help a government to win wars, it is not going to strengthen its power. Let's remind everybody that there is a difference between technological innovation and military innovation. Military innovation actually means a, a, a transformation the way an army organizes itself in order to transform itself into power. But AI is not a military innovation in itself. By itself, it doesn't have much strategic outcomes. It's more kind of like a combustion engine or something similar. Technological superiority is never a decisive factor in itself, especially in irregular wars. So technology is rarely the only factor that actually strengthens the balance of power. But what makes the difference is the way the organization's governments make choices regarding the adoption of new technologies and the way the armies actually use them or are forced to use them. Bureau the military bureaucracy will actually change the way the systems that are based on AI will be integrated in the army forces. Other factors need to be taken into account. I can't give you the details, but like legal challenges, etc. There are also some risks that are linked to the use of military uses. I want to actually highlight the fact that there are several risks in using AI. Security risks that can actually lead to more international risks. Number two, uh, moral, ethical and social risks, for instance, autonomous weapons that could actually lead to more human suffering. So there's an ethical and moral concern right here. And at the same time, we can also say that AI can actually complicate the cognitive uh, understanding and complicates the bureaucracy in uh, security organizations. For instance, being able to outsource uh, the, the decision-making process um, away from human beings. It also has stakes when it comes to privacy, security, transparency, and accountability. Ultimately, there are technological risks. For instance, algorithms are fragile and cannot always make generalizations. So the capacity of AI systems need to be able to handle ambiguous systems, understanding complex situations, and interpreting human behaviors. There's also an opacity the, the um, algorithms have problems, opacity problems in making decisions. So AI problems are evolve, uh, are lead to an evolution instead of, and, and in order to avoid negative problems, we need to educate the decision makers in order to have better results. I still have one minute to conclude. So as a conclusion, I want to talk about two main things. Number one, the link between AI and military power that is a complex issue. Bringing you back to your bureaucracy, organizational preferences, the legal system and cultural issues. Number two, AI is not going to by itself change the way the governments prepare themselves for war. But a powerful nation that has a way to actually use data could potentially gain a competitive advantage that is significant. We need to actually implement awareness raising mechanisms in order to understand the true power of AI. Thank you. Donc, uh, merci à tous nos panelistes. Nous sommes en retard sur le temps. Donc, Thank you very much to all our panelists. We are running late, so I think we'll just skip the Q&A session. I'm sure that if you get a hold of a panelist, they will be delighted to answer all the questions that you may have. 
or you can also write directly to them. There, Savia, for instance, Mr. Savia is still uh, here with us on Zoom, but we, I'm sorry, we need to do that if we want to finish on time. So we'll see you in five minutes for the last, the last session. And again, a big thank you to our panelists.